Humeral shaft fractures. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Uh, slides are by Dr. Christopher Sugalski and I'm Saka Brahma narrating. This is our third video in this slide deck. We've also we've already covered anatomy, surgical approaches. Uh, we talked about uh, intramedullary nailing uh, techniques, a little bit about minimally invasive uh, plating. We talked about um, indications, operative versus non-operative. And um, so we're going to pick up with that and uh, continue on with uh, talking about functional bracing of humeral shaft fractures. We're going to talk about um, operative indications and uh, go through um, some controversies, ORIF uh, versus intramedullary nailing and a little bit more about MEPO techniques. And then in the last, the next and last video in this slide deck, we'll talk more about uh, extra thick extra-articular uh, distal third fractures, as well as uh, radial nerve palsies, and then uh, wrap up. So a little bit about functional bracing of humeral shaft fractures. So um, in this study, uh, 98 patients were treated non-operatively, um, and sagittal deformity uh, tolerated to 20 degrees uh, without clinical impact or deformity. Uh, varus was noted to be tolerated to 30 degrees uh, without problems and shortening within 3 centimeters. So these are a lot of the parameters that we tend to use um, for acceptable alignment. Uh, and uh, they certainly suggested that uh, these can be treated by uh, splinting. And this is, you know, paper from 1966. So uh, Augusta Sarmiento uh, really popularized the functional bracing method, which allows you to um, sort of avoid the problems with uh, fracture immobilization, such as joint stiffness and muscle atrophy and loss of function, and uh, avoid those things, but also avoiding the risks of surgery. Uh, and uh, Dr. Sarmiento's uh, uh, you know, results are quoted often and uh, techniques are still used today. Uh, so in this paper, 51 patients treated with functional bracing um, and they were splinted for a week and then put into a plastic kind of a clamshell uh, compressive brace. Active range of motion was encouraged. Uh, all fractures healed and restoration of uh, motion in all joints before fracture healing and the uh, conclusion was that uh, early introduction of functional activity seems to provide a desirable environment conducive to rapid healing. In 2000, a uh, much larger study, 922 patients treated with functional bracing, excluded polytrauma and high-velocity gunshot injuries, and uh, follow-up, as to be expected, is you know not that high, um, but uh, fairly low rates of non-union. Um, angulation uh, was... Um, generally within what we would consider normal limits, right? So uh, only 2% greater than 25 degrees varus, uh, only 7% greater than uh, 15 degrees on the sagittal, and uh, motion loss um, was uh, relatively mild. So um, another study, 2006, isolated humeral shaft fractures, 90% union, 10% radial nerve palsy, uh, and... Um, you know, their recommendation was really need a randomized clinical trial, right? Uh, another study, 213 patients, uh, operative versus non-operative, right? It's a retrospective study and no significant difference in uh, non-union or malunion. And here you can see some other data pulled from that study. Here's an interesting paper that uh, has been quoted quite a bit. Uh, this is from Journal Orthopedic Trauma 2017, uh, that says, well, how do you know when a fracture is going to go on to non-union? So you're treating somebody non-surgically, they're in your office, um, you don't want to end up at a point that's been months down the road and doesn't heal, and the patient says, well, why did we get to this point? If I knew it wasn't going to heal, I would have fixed it. And you're probably thinking the same thing. So here in this paper, 84 patients were treated non-operatively, 87% healed at six months, and what they noted was that clinical fracture mobility in the clinic six weeks post-injury predicted non-union. So if you see a patient in clinic and they still have what you can perceive as fracture mobility at six weeks, then high likelihood they're going to go on to non-union. So that 
potentially can help you predict. Um, going back to an older study, um, what you can see here is that these are patients treated in a humeral um, functional brace, and which are the ones that went on to non-union? So it's actually proximal fractures, right? So proximal third fractures, 29% went on to non-union. So uh, that is a region where you do have to be a little bit cautious and advise your patients that they may be at higher risk for non-union. So what about a randomized clinical trial? So uh, this is titled the Effective Surgery versus Functional Bracing on Functional Outcome among Patients with Closed Displaced Humeral Shaft Fractures, FISH Randomized Control Trial. This is JAMA. Uh, in 2020, so high impact journal. Uh, and this, uh, this is in Finland, uh, 82 patients, um, some crossover. Uh, and what they found was that uh, early functional outcomes were better with open reduction and internal fixation, but at 12 months, DASH scores had no significant difference. Um, what about functional bracing um, in a more recent study? Uh, here's a multi-center retrospective analysis, nine institutions where fractures were treated non-operatively with a functional fracture brace. Uh, in this study, quite a few ultimately required surgery up to 30%, um, 60% non-union, 24% malalignment. So it just seems like we're not doing as well um, with these, perhaps as some of the older data suggested, for whatever reason, we can speculate. Um, Another study, conservative versus operative treatment of humeral shaft fractures, meta-analysis. So again, this is another way to look at this question um, with um, non-surgical uh, treatment, somewhat higher non-union rates in this study, 15% versus 6%, but no difference in radial nerve palsy, time to union, or DASH scores. So let's talk a little bit about operative treatment of humeral shaft fractures. So um, here's actually from JBJS reviews, uh, with, um, this is kind of like levels of evidence. So, um, we have, you could say grade B recommendation that most humeral shaft fractures will heal with non-operative management. So not quite the strongest recommendation, but reasonable recommendation. Uh, when indications for not operative treatment are met, plate fixation is reliable and safe. Okay, it's a grade A recommendation. Nail fixation may be helpful in pathologic or highly accommodated fractures, but routine use of nails seems to be associated with more shoulder dysfunction, even with the best of techniques. It's a grade A recommendation. And radial nerve palsy and closed fracture usually resolved without surgical intervention. So not quite as strong a recommendation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about radial nerve palsy in the next and last video of this slide deck. So what about instead of ORF versus clo or operative versus non-operative, what about if you're going to operate, do you do a plate or a nail? So um, going back to our uh, JBGS review, uh, in this uh, case, comparing 547 patients, ORF, 240 with instrumental area nailing, multiple series, times a union, perhaps a little longer with uh, open reduction internal fixation, but other numbers pretty similar, right? But shoulder impingement problems. So with instrumental area nailing, you get a lot more shoulder problems. Now, uh, depending on how it's looked at, their relative risk is multiple times. And... Uh, with plate fixation, it's really fairly low. So, uh, and again, this is anterograde nailing, which is, I think, what more of the modern techniques utilize. But um, I think, unfortunately, you know, there is a substantial risk of shoulder problems, even with the best of techniques that you have to keep in mind. So early postoperative outcomes of plate versus nail fixation. Uh, this is from um, like a database, uh, Nesquip data. A uh, lot of patients, so 2009 patients, most treated with ORF, but a good number with intramedial area nailing. And uh, the patients selected for intramedial area nailing had more comorbidities. Uh, maybe they weren't ideal surgical candidates. Um, and uh, that said, 
uh, length of stay complications and readmission rates, which is the kind of thing you can kind of get from these large database studies, did not differ after propensity score adjustment. What about other data like um, length of stay, 30-day readmissions, ORF versus nailing? Well, this is another database query. And uh, at least when you look at uh, length of stay and readmissions, no significant difference. I'm not sure why there would be. A few words about MEPO technique. We talked about this uh, in one of the previous videos in the slide deck. Um, a little bit of data. So uh, here is a um, paper from Journal Orthopedic Trauma 2015. This was a similar case, an image shown in the previous video in this slide deck. Randomized controlled trial 2010 to 2011. Uh, ORF versus minimally invasive uh, plate fixation and uh, basically no significant differences in uh, our time, but uh, notably no significant difference in complications, which is one of the things you would worry about uh, with minimally invasive uh, plate osteosynthesis, uh, as well as other things, uh, malunion, uh, you know, because you have to get indirect reduction, uh, maybe nonunion uh, if you are not, uh, you know, if you're distracting and Again, it's a reduction issue when you're doing it indirect, but they had no significant difference. Um, another randomized control trial, minimally invasive osteosynthesis versus functional fracture brace, right? So doing um, you know, ORF, but with a minimal invasive technique versus, versus bracing. And what they found was that um, uh, somewhat better DASH scores, uh, lower... Um, rates of non-union, uh, better overall alignment, so somewhat favorable um, for those, uh, and but no significant difference in SF36, um, coronal displacement, and uh, there were a few MIPO complications, radial nerve palsy, infection, etc., that you won't have with the non-surgical treatment. So if you go to JAOS 2018, you can uh, look at a review paper, um, uh, you can look at a review on this and current state of the art. And uh, they looked at 24 studies, 581 patients, and uh, it's fairly low risk of complications with this. So what about nail versus plate? Here's a meta-analysis of 15 trials, 839 patients. Similar results in operative time, shoulder scores, nerve injury, delayed union, uh, blood loss, perhaps a little bit lower with nailing. Infection rates uh, here shown between uh, intramedullary nailing and minimally invasive plating. Uh, and uh, non-unions are slightly higher with intramedullary nailing. All right, so we're going to pause here, and then we'll finish up with extra articular distal thirds. We'll also talk about radial nerve palsy and complications and wrap up this slide deck in the fourth and final video. Thanks.